Today we're going to talk about uh, polymer dynamics, diffusion, and kinetics. So um, specifically we're going to be referring to um, some theory developed by two very, very famous polymer physicists right on the same page with Flory and uh, the Flory Huggins theory that we've kind of uh, worked with before. So we're going to talk about some theory developed by Dejan and Edwards. So again, not all, you know, two amazing polymer physicists, very different backgrounds. Um, Edwards was a little bit more conservative in terms of his uh, kind of personal life. Dejan was a little bit more colorful, but Dejan um, was actually called the uh, the Newton of the 21st century. So very, very, very um, amazing, brilliant polymer physicist developed some really interesting theories. And what we're going to get into today, which is these concepts of reptation, and specifically this problem of this interesting and perplexing plot that uh, confused people for many, 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 many years as polymer physicists, but we'll get into that a little bit later on uh, in this video. So we are going to be talking about, uh, and actually this idea of reptation pretty soon, but more generally just polymer uh, dynamics. So fusion, kinetics, uh, and we're going to look at kind of these ideas of the Rouse regime, the reptation regime, entanglements. So when polymers are kind of constrained by these topological obstacles where they can't move past one another in certain molecular weight regimes versus other regimes when we have our spaghetti where they could kind of slide past and move back. Um, so topological obstacles, i.e. entanglements, topological constraints at high molecular weights. When molecular weight is much lower, they could slide past one another, these chains. And there's going to be this critical molecular weight where this will occur, typically 10 to 4 grams per mole, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to look at like this disentanglement time or longest relaxation time or reptation time and these kind of Rouse time and how these kind of overlap. So we're going to be looking at two different regimes, the Rouse regime and the reptation regime, and how this will affect polymer viscosity, diffusion, kinetics, and all of these kind of uh, really, really cool parameters. So um, we are going to look at polymer dynamics in the solution, and more importantly today, we're going to be focused a lot on the melt state. Uh, and we melt state, no solvent, all polymers, all the time. <laughs> so um, in this melt state, we're going to be highly interpenetrated. So we're going to occupy or overlap or interpenetrate the volume occupied by the other polymers. So they're going to be chains kind of stuck on one another. Again, this is kind of your spaghetti looking uh, kind of idea. And at certain molecular weights, every single chain can act as kind of this top logical obstacle. So like these series of X's. So again, one polymer chain these will be kind of barriers for the motion of these other polymers, you know, let's say this polymer chain here. So it's going to be hard or prevent the motion, the free motion, the unconstrained motion of a different polymer chain blue here. So we are going to call these topological constraints. Oops, excuse me. Oops. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, we are going to call these uh, topological constraints that, again, hinder the free motion, these entanglements. And these are going to occur, again, at the macro scale, spaghetti noodles getting stuck. Um, and we'll, see, we'll come up with some actually pretty fun uh, little examples. But uh, these obstacles are inherently kinetic. So uh, it's going to reflect, the, you know, when these topological obstacles appear, we're going to see that in the polymer viscosities and also in the uh, diffusivities. So these properties are going to be affected by the presence of these topological constraints, which are going to occur at certain molecular weights. So... Um, so let's focus again, the viscosity and self-diffusion of polymers in the melt state, again, no solvent. So experimentally, for many, many, many years, uh, we, uh, you know, as polymer physicists, um, we were able to kind of reproduce this curve here that you see below in figure one um, for many, 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 many different types of polymer blend, or melts. Um, and we saw this change in slope of the polymer viscosity in the melt state, so no solvent, uh, as a function of molecular weight. So at some critical molecular weight or entanglement molecular weight, the scaling exponent changes at this, again, that critical or entanglement molecular weight. Um, so we see this change in scaling from viscosity scaling with one as a function of molecular weight to this very non-intuitive 3.4 value. And whenever you're dealing with scaling parameters, like you know, like we saw halves and three, you know, some of those scaling parameters, but this value of 3.4 was also very perplexing. Um, and the other thing that we need to consider here is we're dealing with polymers in the melt state. 
So since this is for polymers in the melt, only polymers, no solvents, there's no solvent effect that can matter here. So this was really perplexing because you know, you know, we've seen viscosity can change depending on uh, kind of our solvent quality and we can kind of change the size of our polymers, et cetera, et cetera. But this was um, a very non-intuitive result. So again, below our critical molecular weight, viscosity scales as one. Above M sub C, we see that it scales with this 3.4. So, and this 3. Point, going from 1 to 3.04 for power law scaling, that is a dramatic increase uh, in viscosity. So, we call this low molecular weight regime the Rouse regime, and the high molecular weight regime the reptation regime. So, we're going to see why we call it that in a second, uh, and we're going to see that uh, kind of the discrepancy or that critical molecular weight for the crossover between these two regimes depends on, again, this idea of entanglements which are, again, these permanent topological constraints um, or effective, effective um, permanent topological constraints, um, basically due to the fact that um, polymers will tend to become entangled and interpenetrate when they're concentrated, i.e. when the molecular weight increases. So, uh, again, this is the entanglement molecular weight. We also see some interesting uh, um, scaling behavior with uh, basically not only or actually with the viscosity here, you see the Rouse and reputation regime. Now, one interesting thing we're going to see actually with the fusion as well in just a second. Um, but one really interesting thing is that your critical molecular weight or entanglement, so you'll see M sub C, M sub E as well, it's only around 10 to the fourth grams per mole. This isn't a very large uh, number of heat units. So if you're looking at polystyrene, for example, so C, H, group C, H, Panel. We just need an N, or a number of our P units, an N of about 200 to hit this critical molecular weight um, in order to get those kind of topological constraints. So that's a really, really, you know, it's, it's, you don't need a high degree of polymerization necessarily to be in this reptation regime. Um, but additionally, you could, again, look at the chemical structure of your polymers in order to get some insight into the critical molecular weight. So specifically, if our chain is more flexible, it's going to entangle more easily, or it's going to, our M sub E, let me actually draw a polymer right here, our old friend. Our poly, um, if our polymer is more flexible, we are going to entangle earlier or more easily, and thus our M sub C will decrease as our C infinity decreases, or as our flexibility flexibility increases. So more flexible polymers, easier to entangle. So they will have this, they'll hit this uh, kind of critical or entanglement molecular weight uh, earlier at a lower molecular weight. So what this means is that my entanglement molecular weight for polyethylene is going to be less than my entanglement molecular weight of polystyrene. So uh, again, so polyethylene, much smaller critical molecular weight because polystyrene has this larger phenyl group. Uh, it inhibits that chain flexibility and that ability to kind of entangle. So there's not only this difference in scaling between the, for the viscosity as a function of molecular weight, but the diffusivity of polymers as well will show uh, kind of this change in scaling behavior. So if you look here, our log of diffusivity versus log of molecular weight, again, as you might expect, diffusivity decreases as our uh, molecular weight increases, which should hopefully... Uh, makes some sense. But again, we see this different scaling. In the Rouse regime, D scales inversely with the log molecular weight. But here we have this to the minus two power uh, for the reptation regime. So this gets us into um, a conversation where we're going to get into it a little bit. Actually, we'll continue it on in this video. So let's think about and remind ourselves about diffusivity for a second. Um, so in small molecules, or liquids, we could kind of model um, diffusion essentially is, is just this kind of random stochastic jumps um, between molecules of adjacent free volume. So your atom, or in metals too, we're kind of hopping, right? We have some frequency of hopping between our nearest neighbors. So some frequency new, hopping, we know that diffusion is going to be this Arrhenius exponential relationship. We saw that in the last video, nice QA over KT. As it increases thermal energy, my hopping rate increases, and the probability to kind of hop into these next places depends on, again, these kind of free volume. And for polymers, it's very similar. Um, monomers are going to jump and move through 
be uh, basically this idea of free volume. So again, this thermal fluctuations, how much we, you know free volume we can access as a function of temperature. Get back to our glass transition uh, in several videos ago. Now, the key thing is, as you might expect, because polymers are connected, polymer units, as opposed to kind of just free gas molecules running around, the diffusivity of polymers is going to be much less. So it's going to be typically on the order of 10 to the minus 14 to minus 18 centimeter squared per second. You'll typically see the centimeter squared per second for uh, a lot of diffusivities. But for gas, mo you know, small molecules, we could be, so small molecules, it could be 10 to the minus 5 centimeter squared per second. So this is a huge difference. This is a 9 to 13 order of magnitude difference. Um, so let's think about the implication in terms of how much distance is traveled uh, and the discrepancy here. So I could measure, hopefully you remember the uh, approximation from material science. So actually, or if you remember the equation for Brownian motion, but we could relate essentially uh, x squared is going to be equal. Uh, if we remember all the way back. So again, if we're assuming that we're, um, uh, our kind of engineering approximation for diffusion, we said that, excuse me, x equals 1 over 2 uh, root dt. So again, factors, prefactors doesn't really matter, but we could use this kind of fundamental expression for uh, Brownian motion to kind of estimate the distance that we could travel, you know, in a second. So let's look at small molecules and see if t equals 1 second, how fast can we uh, travel? So d, we just said previously 10 to the minus 5, you know, centimeters squared, so approximately 10 to the minus 3 centimeters. So 10 to the minus 5 meters. So in one second, a small molecule can move 10 to the minus 5 meters. That is, again, these small molecules, let's say it's typically on the order of 1 nanometer. So small molecules can move 10 to the 4th times their size in one second. That is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly fast. Now, let's do the same thing for polymers. So polymers, again, even the, let's take it to the fastest, 10 to the minus 14 centimeters squared per second. Polymers, let's say they're typically on the order of 10 nanometers or even 100 nanometers, you know, uh, can large, or, you know, most, uh, you know, that's on average. This is not a high molecular weight polymer. Let's say that our size is this. So we can see that it's going to move about, you know, calculating it out here, one nanometer in one second. So we're going to only, here we were able to move 10 to the fourth times our size. Here we can move 0 0.1 times our size. So a tenth of our size. So the polymers are moving much, 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 much more slowly, uh, uh, basically, uh, than small molecules due to the kind of diffusive motion. Um, and this gets even worse if you take, again, our, our lower limit for diffusivity. Um, so the polymer is going to experience very, very, very little diffusive motion. So when you think about the time it will take for a polymer to diffuse a length equal to its size, you're looking at times on the order of, you know, hours. So 60 minutes times 60 seconds, you know, so you're getting into, you know, again, very, very, very long time scales. So this has um, clear processing implications. So we can diffuse, um, actually has really severe processing implication because our diffusion time is going to be tuned based on our molecular weight, our scaling regime. So we know that the diffusivity scales as, uh, for as a function of molecular weight to the minus one for the Rouse regime, but diffusivity or the log of diffusivity scales as uh, uh, basically d to the molecular weight minus two, excuse me, for the reptation regime. So it is going to have very, very strong processing implications that we're going to see in uh, just a second. But one of the cool things you could do is you can get a very rough estimate of your relaxation time. We talked about that last time in our Deborah number conversation, but we didn't really explicitly say how do you measure relaxation time. But one way you could kind of roughly estimate it is just by looking at the time required for a polymer to diffuse a length equal to its size or radius of gyration. So we can get an idea of the relaxation time here, tau star, back from our Deborah number, to kind of look at and see what is the relaxation time of our polymer. So next time we're gonna get into the Rouse regime try to figure out and explain these scaling parameters and see um, if we can recover them. And then finally, what step or what adjustment do we have to make to kind of account for these very anomalous scaling behaviors 
as a function of molecular weight for pure polymers. So we'll get into more of that next time. Thanks. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.